So, oops, I thought I had that open. Uh, let's see. Week four, lecture. Okay. So this week, we are talking about loops. Um, and loops are, are an extremely powerful tool. They are almost an extension of what we did last week, which is branching. Looping is, in fact, a form of branching. And what we're going to do is we're going to be able to run our code repeatedly. Um, and as the data changes, the outcome of the code might change. And this is really our second foray into data-driven code. Last week was our first. We saw how if we asked a question to Python, Python's behavior could change based on the outcome of that question, whether it was true or whether it was false. We learned how to combine questions, and we're going to continue on that path, but we're going to add to it. We're going to augment it, and the way we're augmented it augmenting it is to do loops. So this is our first foray into code reusability. And I will be talking about code reusability for the remainder of this class. It is my favorite topic in programming because code reusability makes your code maintainable. And if you are designing it with reusability in mind, it will also make your code there will be less maintenance. It will make it easier to write. So reusability is very, very important. And by reusability, I am not talking about copy and pasting. I am talking about using loops, functions. By the time we get to week eight, it will be classes to reuse code again and again and again. Well, how do we reuse code? How do we do that? Well, we make our code data-driven. So we know what kind of data we're expecting, and we write the code so the outcome of that code changes based on the data that we get. Um, we did that last week. We're going to do this more, more this week. We're going to do it a lot next week. Um, so we're going to use loops and functions as the really big part of reusability in this class. If it were Java, we would be into object-oriented world. Uh, we don't get into object oriented until we get to week eight in this class. Why is it important to reduce the amount of code you have to write and maintain? Whoops, let me go back to that one. Sorry. I wasn't quite finished. Um, somebody's paying you to write code. I, I, some people do code coding altruistically, and I think that's great. There are a lot of things if you're interested in doing that. There are a lot of different kinds of projects on GitHub where you can go out and do um, and, and code and start by testing if you really want to do that. There are a lot of people who do. But in my world, I'm paid, a company pays me to write code to do specific things. Part of my job is not just to write that code, but to write high quality code. To write high quality code, I want to make sure my code is testable, it's reusable, and it's overall maintainable. There is a concept called spaghetti code. And spaghetti code looks like a bowl of spaghetti, and it's extremely fragile, and it breaks. Oops. Sorry about that. And it breaks. We don't want code that breaks. We want code that works the way we expect it to work. And that's why maintainability is such a big part of it. Um, it there, there's a an idiom. Um, it costs if you find a mistake, if you find a flaw in the requirements phase of computer software, it will cost you a dollar to fix. If you find it in design, it will cost ten dollars to fix the same the same problem. If you cost it in coding, it will cause cause you a hundred dollars to fix. And if you cause it when it's out at the customer site, it will cause you a thousand dollars cost a thousand dollars to fix. So it goes up by a magnitude of ten the closer it gets to the customer. So if we write reusable, maintainable code in the beginning, we're going to be saving ourselves a lot of hassle 
and our company a lot of money. Okay, so here's what we have. We have some new keywords and some new concepts. We have the words while and for. Those are both types of loops and they're different. They work a little differently. And we're gonna go through each one of them. We have the word in, which is used with a for loop to check for the presence of an element in a sequence or a value in a sequence. We have, we have some things that can control the loop. So we have, a, we have a word called break, which will just stop the loop. We have a word called continue, which will say stop here and go back to the top of the loop. Go back up to that while or for loop and, and do it again. So we have two new concepts that we have to think about. We have the concept of iteration. And an iteration is just one full execution of the code inside the local scope of a loop. Just like um, branches, have local scopes, loops have local scopes because they're part of a branch. So in that local scope, one iteration is a full passage through the local scope of the code. And then when you go back outside to, to the while or the for loop, you are at the top of the loop and you'll go through another iteration again. So we're gonna start with while loops. While loops are, are good for lots of things. From your perspective for this class, you're going to be using a while loop as your main game playing loop. Sorry, I had to get a drink. So you need to get familiar with while loops. You need to understand how they work because you're going to need this for your game. And we're going to be talking about the game a little this week, a little next week, a little more the following week so that we can understand the concepts that will go into making up that game. So I'm just gonna have a little Python code here. I have a variable called test. Its, it's initial value is go, the word go. I have this new stuff, while test is not equal to Q. And then I have the stuff in, inside the local scope of the while loop after that. So, for a while loop, you are barred from entering the while loop or a for loop until the condition is evaluates to true. So, there's still true false questions, just like last week. The while keyword just says, Python, you're about to you're about to answer the same question repeatedly until it evaluates the false. Once it evaluates the false, that's it. The loop is done. So um, a while loop requires something called a sentinel value. And the sentinel value is what tells the loop to stop. Generally, that's the way it's written. So in this case, I have a variable called test. Test is going to contain the value that I am going to evaluate against the sentinel value. In this case, the sentinel value is Q. Q is for quit. Do I want to quit the loop or do I want to keep going? So while tells Python it's going to have to make a decision repeatedly. What it's making the decision based on is the value of test and how it relates to the sentinel value in this case, which is Q. The relation is defined by the conditional operator. In this case, the conditional operator is not equal. So I can read this while loop is, as long as the test is not equal to Q, sorry, as long as the value of test is not equal to Q, keep going. So if, if a user puts in anything other than a single letter Q, lowercase letter Q, the, the loop is just going to keep going and just going to keep going. The one thing about wonderful thing about while loops is you can program them so that they run forever. 
The bad thing about while loops is you can program them so they can run forever. So you have to be very careful. So what's inside the local scope of the while loop? Just like last week, we have to indent it properly. And what I have two lines here. I have print your input, open squiggly, close squiggly, dot format test. So I'm just going to print out what the user entered. And then I am, and this is important, inside the loop, I am asking for the next, the value to test against the Sentinel value. So if I put in A, B, C, D, E, then the loop would keep going because A, B, C, D, E is not the same as Q. If I put in the single letter case Q, which is lowercase, it will break the execution of the loop. Okay. A few rules. Sentinel is a value which defines the exit condition of the loop. A while loop will execute until the Sentinel value reaches the exit condition. Um, like all conditional statements, a while statement must end with a colon. Don't forget the colon. Just like if, else, else statements, you got to have a colon for any of the decision makers in Python. And a while loop is a decision maker. So let's just follow the test real quick. Excuse me. So this is the code that was on the last slide. I'm in my while loop. Test, you'll notice that test is set outside of the while loop. It is set outside of the while loop so that we can actually get into the while loop. So we set it to something that is not, in this case, the Sentinel value. So I'm going to print and I'm going to test. So it's going to ask me to uh, input test. I'm going to input hello. We go up to the top of the loop. I finished the first iteration. The first iteration was when it printed out the, the your input is, or your input, and then it did the test asking for input from the, the user. So now it's going to say, okay, test is hello, which is not Q. So we're going to execute the loop again. We're going to print out some stuff. We're going to ask for user input. So now I'm going to input Q. So I'm back up to the top of the loop. I've completed the second iteration. The second iteration was when test was equal to hello. And now Q is not equal Q evaluates the false. So that means the loop is done. And so each trip through the while loop is called an iteration. It is important in a while loop to understand that if you have a condition that changes the outcome of the question that the while loop is asking, that you have the ability to have the user input it inside the local scope of the while loop. It's very important for your game. You're going to go into a while loop and you're going to keep running that while loop until uh, your, your player dies, which means the game ends. Your player wins, which means the game ends or Professor Lisa enters the queue, quit, exit, whatever you define, and then the game ends. So while loop flowchart. Flow this is just to show you from a diagrammatic perspective what a loop looks like. So we're not going to spend a massive amount of time on this, but basically this is our code. Test is go if test is not equal to queue, Sorry, let me rephrase that. Test is not equal to Q, true or false. If it's true, we're going to output test. We're going to input test again. And then we're going to go ask the question again. So you'll notice the word while is not in this flowchart. And that is on purpose. While is not in this flowchart because while is kind of language specific. But flowcharts are language agnostic. So what we have here is we have the representation of a loop. So you can see that all those arrows just keep going around until test 
is not equal to Q comes out as false. So test is not equal to Q, true or false. When that is false, we follow the false line and we're done. So here's just a little, oh, this is all in the wrong order. I apologize. And we don't need to go through this again. Uh, that the animation for that was just messed up. I apologize. Yes. The, Michelle, the copies of the slides are not available. Uh, I don't make them available um, because they're my intellectual property and I've had some other things taken and used. So I keep the slides, but the, um, the, the, the recording of this will be up on YouTube tomorrow, up on my channel. So let's talk about continue. Oops, sorry about that. Let's talk about continue. So I've just been through a loop, a while loop. That's fine. Sorry, I'm sorry, not continue. Counting with while. So oftentimes you don't necessarily need the, you're not going to necessarily ask for user input. Sometimes you just want to count so up to some number of things, whatever those things are. So in a while loop, we can count. It's very much the same concept. We have a variable called counter counter holds our test value. We're starting at, at zero. The sentinel value in this case is three. So when I look at the while loop, I'm asking the question, is counter less than three true or false? When it's zero, it's true. When it's one, it's true. And when it's two, it's true. So how does this work within the loop? What happens is I'm going to Counter is zero, so I will go into the loop. When I'm in the loop, I'm actually going to change the value of counter. I'm going to increment it by one, which will then go back up to the top of the loop, evaluate it, go through the loop, increment it by one. You have to remember to increment. If you get a timeout error in Zybooks, it's because you were using a loop and you were not incrementing inside the loop. You were using a while loop and you were not incrementing or you were not testing the sentinel value correctly. Zybooks will not allow your while loop to run forever. It will stop it and say you have a timeout error. Other than PyCharm, PyCharm will let it chew up all the memory in your computer. So be careful. So we're going to now, actually let's go to PyCharm and look for a while while with sentinel while count let's do while count so um this is just a simple counter like we saw and i kind of want to run through it again so i have n equal 10 n is just a number and i have counter equal zero and my 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 question is Sorry, my statement is counter is less than or equal to n, true or false. If counter is less than or equal to n, then I'm going to output it and then I'm going to increment the counter. So let us run. Uh, wait a minute. What is this? Wow, count. And let's debug it because we all know how much I like the debugger. So I have a couple of variables defined. And by the way, I just defined n up here because I didn't feel like doing an input statement because I just want to concentrate on what's happening in the while loop. So I am at line six, as we know. I have a breakpoint. The blue line is on line six. I have not yet executed line six. So I have while. I have counter which is 0, and n, which is 10. Since 0 is less than or equal to 10, I am going to print out the value of counter, 
and now I'm going to increment counter. I go up to the top of the loop, counter is 1, I'm still good, counter is 2, I'm good, 3, and we will just continue until we get to all done. So I'm, I hit 9, I'm going to go to 10 because it's less than or equal to, I'm at 11, and I drop out of the loop because 11 is not less than or equal to 10. So that is how you do counting with a while loop. Now let me show you counting with the Sentinel. Um, so this is just another script similar to what we saw on the slide. So I have a Sentinel value of Q and I have my loop here. So let's just run through this. By the way, as the class goes on, I'm going to be going more towards going through examples um, because things are getting more complex. And I think it's important to see how they are actually working. I am going to have the slides and talk about things, but we're going to spend more time in PyCharm. So, Uh, hold on, let me see. Uh, why isn't my step over not highlighted in my pie charm? It won't let me debug. Sorry, random. Not a problem, Greg. How about we talk about that afterwards and we see what's going on um, and we'll go through some of the steps of debugging. We'll do that after the class, though. So, I am, no problem. Okay, debugging, a stop and rerun. Okay, so I am. I have answer equal y. I am now at the top of my loop, and I have y not equal to q. y is not equal to q, so my outcome is true which means I will go into the local scope of the loop. I will say answer equals input. What is the answer? I'm going to say the answer is 42. I'm going to print it. Now I'm up at the top of the loop. Answer is now 42 because I changed it inside the loop. It's going to say answer equal input. What is the answer? I'm going to say the answer is now Q going to output Q. I'm at the top of the loop. Q is not equal to Q. Evaluates to false. Then I'm done with the loop. So I'm out back out in the global scope and I'm done. So that's what we have for while loops. And now we're going to talk about a for loop. I have to say I use for loops more in my daily work than I do while loops. That may simply be the kind of stuff that I'm writing, but that's, that's always been the case. So a for loop is just another form of a loop. A for loop, however, is made for counting. It's made for lists. It's made for dictionaries. It's made for structured data and collections of data. And it's much easier to use when you're going over things like a string, a list, than a while loop would be, simply because there are more things in Python that Python kind of just gives you. So I have the word for. For tells Python it is about, it is going to be making decisions repeatedly. A for loop does not have a sentinel value. Um, a for loop uses um, a variable that you define in the same statement as the for loop, and then it has a range, a, a collection, that you're going to loop over. So you're not going to get a lot of input that's changing the outcome of the loop. The loop outcome in a for loop is usually predetermined. 
by the type of data that it's looking at, by the fact that it's going to be some numbers that you're looking through that maybe you only want to look through the first 100 of the database entries. So that would be a use for a for loop. Maybe I have eight rooms in my game and I need to go through each one of those rooms for some reason and look for something. Now you probably won't have to do that, depends on how complex you want to make your game. That would be a use for a for loop while Using a while loop in your game has to be the main gameplay loop because um, somebody's going to be sitting there running that game and making input, and that the input is going to directly change how the game is running. So what do I have in front of me? I have the word for. I have num. Num is just a variable. Could just as easily be Fred. Um, and it is a variable that only exists in the local scope of the for loop. I have a new keyword called in, which says, hey for, expect a sequence. And then I have this new function called range. Range will create a sequence for me. I don't have to create the sequence. I don't have to define the sequence. I just have to give it a starting point, at most, a starting point, an ending point, and how many times to increment it. So, and a colon, sorry, and a colon. So that's what, that's what that for loop has in it. It, ha it basically reads, as long as num is less than three, keep going. And then I'm going to print num.formatNum, and that's it. Now, if we think about this, that's less code than what I wrote for the while loop just a slide ago. So... This is counting with a while loop. One, two, three, four lines of code. This is counting with a for loop. Two lines of code. My general philosophy is if I can write two lines of code to do the same thing I can do in four lines of code, there would have to be a really, really, really good reason for me not to use the two-line way of writing code simply because I'm writing less code. I have less code to maintain later. And I'm also using the correct constructs for this type of loop. So for loops are made for counting. While loops are made for user input that will change the outcome of the loop. Or, and we're not doing that in this class, you want to run something like a timer, which would be an infinite loop, and it would only break given a certain condition. So let's see. That's a for loop. Yeah, we just did that. All right, let's go to the next slide. For with rain. Hold on, let me see what the next one is. And what, okay, why is a letter used in the Zybooks examples without being assigned as a variable beforehand in a, in a for statement? Like in the example, a loop assigns a dictionary's keys to the loop variable for C in channels. Okay. I'm not happy with Zybooks because they go ahead sometimes. That, what you're looking at there is really something that should be explained and talked about in module, in module six because module six is when we do uh, dictionaries, lists and dictionaries. But for now, what I'm showing you now is the simplest form of a for loop. You can in fact have C. So in the for loop, that variable can be anything. I, I said num. It could be C. What they're talking about here is they, are, they have got a set of keys from a dictionary, and they're going to do a for loop over the keys from that dictionary. So they've got a set. And that specific set is providing the range. So the range isn't a number. Well, the range kind of is a number because there is a finite set of keys for that dictionary. Maybe the dictionary has 10 entries, which means there are 10 keys. And what they're doing for, here, for C in channels is it's getting the key from the set of channels. So that it's a very good question. 
Zybox is the one thing I really don't like about Zybox is they look ahead too much. So we will understand more about what to do about this in Module 6. Does that work, Joey? And if you want to talk about this afterwards and run through some um, examples to make it easier for you now, that's fine too. And, and by the way, the C doesn't, okay, cool. Um, the for loop defines a special variable that's only ac accessible inside the for loop. That's num in this one. Range is a special function, which we're going to learn a little bit more about. And like all conditional statements, you've got to end with a colon. So let's talk about the range function. Range is a function that is provided by Python. You just get it for being for, for using Python. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to control a for loop using um, basically numbers. And you can do start, stop, and increment. So if we look to the right side, uh, the right column on this slide, we see that we have the function range and there are three variables. Now this is the first time in Python where we're really starting to use something called optional arguments, okay? Before, we've pretty much always had to have, you know, if we have a function, we're going to put, you know, if we have an input function, we're going to have a string, and then it's going to input it. Or if we're going to go and we're going to change our input for an integer, there's only one argument in that int function. Here, we have an option of doing things. So if I define all three, I'm going to start with the start number, I'm going to end with the stop number, and I'm going to increment. If I don't, if I look at what's in green, it says range three. Because start and, and increment are optional, what Python does under the hood, it says, OK, I'm going to start at zero. And in this case, because I put three there, it's going to say, I'm going to end at 3 minus 1. That number is not inclusive. And then I'm going to increment by 1. So that's what Python does. So if you just see range with a number in it, that is the stop value, and it is not inclusive. So it will only go to that stop value minus 1. And that's so when you're using lists, you don't walk off the end of a list. Um, what in does is it determines if the value you're looking for is in the sequence. If it's not in the sequence, then you're, you're done with a loop. It, it evaluates defaults and you're done. Um, we will use it here to iterate through range when we're getting into lists. We will also use it to iterate through a list. So let's follow the numbers. There's no teacher needed. What does range do? Range creates a sequence, 0, 1, 2, and, zero, one, and 2. And it's going to say 0. It's going to print num is 0. I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop. 0 goes away. Jessica. Could somebody mute, please? Um, num is now going to be 1. And then we're going to have 2. Num is 2. And then we're going to stop because there's nothing else in the range. We have gone to 2, which is the only thing range is going to create because it's always that number, the stop, minus 1. And then we're done. So I just want to show you the flow chart real quickly that does the counting. And this is going to look very much like the while one that we saw a little bit ago with sentinel value. I'm going to have a place to start. I'm going to have my question. I'm going to have true false. I'm going to have my loop. And it's no different from a while loop. So when you're dealing with loops, and you're using a flowchart, which you might have to do in an assignment 
Remember, this is what it looks like. That's what a loop looks like. You have the arrows that allow you to go in a round robin fashion until you hit false. Okay, so let's talk about range a little bit more. We're talking about range a little bit more because you just might have a lab very similar to this. So what I'm seeing here is I have four num in range. Num is, again, just a variable. But the range looks different here. The range is starting at 1, going to 6 minus 1, because the stop is always minus 1, and I'm going to increment by 2, which means I only want to print every other element. I don't want to print. I want to start at 1, so I want to print 1, 3, and 5. So this is how you would print either odds or evens. If, let's say, you had a lab that did that. So this is what we're following. And num is 5. So there it's exactly the same two lines of code did something completely different. All because I gave it a starting point and an incrementing point. Now, I don't have an example, but you can also go backwards. You can have an increment of, let's say, minus 1. You can start at 6 and go to 1 and increment by minus 2 and get the opposite output. So I would have 5, 3, and 1. So if you need to go backwards through the loop, let's say for a lab, you would have a negative increment. You would start at the larger end and end at the smaller end. You can nest loops. So, um, and by the way, you can also do anything else inside of a loop that we've already done. You can have if statements in a loop. Um, you can have strings. You can have everything in a loop that we've done up till now. Nested loops are important because that's how you read a matrix. And you might just have to read a matrix in one of your labs this week. So let's talk about this concept. What we have here is we have rows and columns. So we're going to have an integer number of row, and rows, an integer for columns. I've got an outer for loop and an inner for loop. The outer for loop is going to go from, I have a variable called outer. So while outer is in range rows, so rows is just a number, for inner in range columns, columns is just a number, I'm going to print a star, and then I'm going to print a space. When I'm all done with every all the columns, then I'm going to print just say a print so I can print a new line. I'm going to go back up to the top and start again for the next row. So let's see what in the world I mean here. Oh, wait a minute. Did I miss a slide? No, I didn't. Okay. And yes. Okay. Okay. So if we go back real quick. Actually, let's go back here. What we saw was a range function. The range function can be used a couple of different ways. We can use it like we did here with a single number in it. We can use it here. We can use it like we did on the other slide with a 1, a 6, and a 2. The 1, because it's positional, says start at the the number one. Stop says end at six minus one because it's not inclusive. And increment says only look at every two. So that's what those numbers are. Start, stop, and increment. So you can do a lot with those. You can go forward through a loop if you wanted to only print the odd um, the odd numbers, you could just do odd numbers. 
you wanted to print even numbers, you could do even numbers. You could do starting at zero, going to six, and then two. So that's what range is. Okay, so nested loops. Nested loops are really the theory, the theory of a matrix. So let's go through this and we will build our matrix. And I'm going to actually do this as the challenge. So I'm going to put in two for rows and two for columns. Now I've got this outer and inner concept. So I'm going to have two rows and two columns per row. So if you're looking at a spreadsheet, that's what you're seeing. You're seeing, I don't have my numbers open. Let me open numbers real quick. Actually, I can just do it in here. Cancel. So what you're seeing is you're seeing something like this. This is a row. This is a row. This is a column. This is a column. So row one has two columns. Row two has two columns. And if you have, let's say, a... Um, a triangle, right triangle, then you would start it a little differently. You wouldn't do it for each column. You, would, you wouldn't have the same number of columns per row. So let's go this one again. I'm getting a little off track. Apologize. So I'm going to enter two for rows. I'm going to enter two for columns. And I've got my little table over here just to keep track of things. So when I start, my outer, the value for outer, the counter for the outer loop, which is called outer, is zero. The next thing I do is I go to my inner loop, my next for loop. So I have inner in range columns. So I've added two for columns. So I have another start down here. And I have inner equals zero. Because I have range, that range can have two. It's automatically going to start at zero if I didn't tell it where to start. And it's auto automatically going to increment by one if I didn't tell it where, how many to increment. So it's basically going to go zero, one. So now I'm going to print a star with a space behind it. Now what's going to happen here? Well, what I have to do, remember, is I'm in two loops, so I'm always going to run the entire inner for loop completely before I go back to the outer one. So I'm going to go back up to the inner for loop. Inner is 0 plus 1, which is 1. So I'm going to print another star. I'm going to go back up to the for loop. I am now at the second iteration. Inner equals 1, which it already is, plus 1, which is 2. So range is 2, which means 2 is not less than 2 because it's always 2 minus range, the, the value of the range minus 1. And so I'm going to print a new line, and I'm going to go up to the top of the outer loop. Now it says if I didn't run anything on the inner loop. It's just completely blanked out over here. It's a brand new start for the inner loop. Even though I've got results from the first inner loop, those results don't go away. But the, it, it's, it's basically drawing a blank slate to go to the next row. So I am now, row 1 is, outer is 0 plus 1, which is 1 now. I'm now starting again cleanly on the inner loop. I'm going, uh, columns is still 2. I'm going to print another star. I'm going to go back up to columns. Columns is now 1. I'm going to print another star. Columns is now two. I am done with the inner loop. I'm going to go back up to the outer loop. Outer is now about to be two, and I'm done. So that's how an inner loop works. When you're thinking about nested loops, always remember the innermost loop 
will run to completion or until you explicitly tell it to break until it'll so it'll run to completion before it goes back up to the outer loop and then once it goes back up to the outer loop and if it goes back to that inner loop as it is as if that inner loop never existed never never executed before it's a clean slate so let's see what's my next slide okay so let us do okay let us do uh, yeah let us do the nested for loop one uh, nested for so here's my nested for loop and I just want to run it through a little bit so you can see also here I have I've, I've made some things explicit and we can also see how we change it if we're going to do something like give it an increment how this will change so for right now, I just have val1 and val2, and um, I'm I'm basically just going to print a number outer inner times outer and then base. So let's run this one. Nested four. Uh, where is that? Nested four and. I'm going to debug it. So I'm going to go to my console and I'm going to put in, let's put in five and three. Whoops. Oh, my bad. I did not uh, step over properly. Stop and rerun. Okay. So I'm going to step over this. I'm going to say five, input number. I'm going to say five. I'm going to step over it. It's waiting for another number three. So I have four outer in range zero comma val. And val one is five. So if I look at frames and variables, and I go look at variables, and I step over, I now have my outer. Whoops, sorry, I have my outer here. But you'll notice there's no like range variable. That's because you don't have, Python doesn't have to create one. It just keeps track of it in its memory. So I'm going to step over. So I have, I now have an inner. So I have my outer variable for my outer for loop and my inner variable for my inner for loop. And I'm just going to run. So let's just run and run and run. Everything on the first row is zero. Then I have zero, one, two. And then I have one, two, four. And I'm going to do for the fifth row, zero, three, six. And zero, four, eight. And I'm going to be finished. So that's just a different way of running it but now let's do something a little different here let's change the inner one to one and let's increment the outer one by two so this time i'm just going to run it or debug it now i'm just going to run it and i'm going to make the top number 12 and i'm going to make the bottom number four and what you'll see is that that changed how this looked didn't it it was zero 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 one two three you know zero two three uh, anyway this has substantially different numbers in it and more rows why does that because I put in different values here plus I also changed um, the increment I, I changed where this one started this one only does it starts at one and goes up every and goes up by one I could have also just made them both so this would be all evens and this would be all odds and if I run it I get let's do 12 
and 3. And I get a substantially different number just by playing with those. So this is this just shows you when I change something in range. Now let's do this again. Let us I'm going to assume that val1 is going to be greater than 10, so I'm going to say 10, and I'm going to say minus 1. So let me run this again, and I'm going to say the input number for rows, let's just make it 12, and the input another number, let's just make that 7, and I'm done. What in the world did I do? Well, let's see what I did. I just changed those numbers, and all of a sudden, nothing ran. The logic didn't change. The numbers changed. So that is something to keep in mind when you are doing your assignments this week. Just going to put this back so I don't mess it up later. So let's talk about break. We're going to talk about ways to control the loop without having to exit the loop. I'm sorry, ways to control the loop without having to run break is ways to control the loop without having to completely run through the loop. I can stop and break, which means just stop the loop, just be done. So here I have a test variable called test. I have a sentinel value called done. And I want to, I'm going to say, what is the answer? And then if the answer is time, then I'm going to say, I don't have a clock. If the answer is 42, then I'm going to say, you've got the right answer, break. Otherwise, I'm going to tell them to try again. So if I put in 42, it's not time, so that's false. I, I flow down to an elif, which is 42 in test. That's going to be the right answer. And I'm going to break, which means I stop. I go down to the outer, I go down back out to the global scope, and I'm done. So I'm sorry if I'm rushing a bit. It's, um, yeah, sorry, I'm running late. So now we have continue. Continue is something that can be used in either a for or a while loop. Break and continue can be used in either. And here, I just have my stir one and two and three. Let's say I don't want to print out the word and. But I want to print out the numbers. So first I'm going to split on a space, which is going to give me a list, one and two and three. And then I'm going to say for item in my list. Now this is a way that Zybooks talks about it that's not about the numbers. It's about the actual elements. So what I'm going to get is I'm going to get one, I'm going to get the word and, then I'm going to get two, then I'm going to get the word and, and then I'm going to get three. So item is one. If item is and, continue, it's not. So then I'm going to print item. Now I'm back up to the top of the for loop. Item is now and. And I'm going to say, is item the same as and? It's going to continue. What continue does is it takes you back up to the loop. In this case, nothing is printed. Two. Item is not and. It's going to print out Number two, it's going to take me back up to the top of the loop. It's going to evaluate AND, which means it's going to continue up to the top of the loop. It's going to give me three, which means it's going to end up printing out the item with a comma, and I'm done. So we have the lab. And I have them here in the flowcharts, but I'm not happy with them because this is crazy. So I am going to go over them again in the uh, pseudocode. Week four pseudocode. 
Okay. Okay, so this is the pseudocode for week four. And it is um, a little more readable than those flow charts. And these will, by the way, will be up on the YouTube site as, as will all the other scripts. So, lab four pseudocode. Given a line of text as input, output the number of characters excluding spaces, periods, or commas. So, a string is in fact a sequence already. So, my suggestion here would be to use a for loop. And I would say for some variable name in the user text that comes in, now, I'm going to output use the character count in the global scope, which means I have to define it in the global scope. So that is why set care count is outside the for loop. That is simply the value that I will be printing out at the very, very end. So that's where I'm keeping count. So then inside my for loop, I have a, a conditional. I'm going to say... If it's not a space and it's not a period and it's not a comma, then I'm going to increment that character count by one. Now the character count has nothing to do with what's going on in that for loop. It is completely separate from it. It does not control the for loop. It simply is being used as a bucket to count the number of characters that don't that are not space period and comma and then at the end i'm just going to output the character count so that's 4.14 i would suggest you use a for loop um, and again especially starting now sometimes it's easier in pycharm to use the debugger than it is to kind of look and see what um Zybooks is doing so if, if you're starting to have problems, my suggestion is to copy the code into PyCharm and run through it in the debugger, especially when you get to the ones that are a little more complex, like this one. So this is just about creating a password. So you're going to put in a word, and you're going to create a password. So you're going to input a word. Now we're going to... Uh, we're going to keep a, a string for password, so that is going to be used in the global scope, which means so it means I have to define it in the global scope, and um, so it has to be defined outside the loop. The same with care count. Care count is going to be used, so we have to define it outside. And, and we're using a while loop here. Sorry, we're using a while loop here. So in this case, we're going to say, we're going to use a while loop, and we're going to say if character count is less than the length of the word, then we're going to say if it equals I, then the password that I'm creating is going to uh, be the password plus an exclamation point. Otherwise, if it's an A, it's going to be the, pa the password I'm creating plus the at. If it's an M, then I'm going to replace that with a capital M. If it's B, I'm going to replace it with 8. If it's O, I'm going to replace it with dot. Otherwise, I'm just going to use the character that I'm getting, which is what happens in the else. Then I'm going to increment character count, and I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop. And I'm going to do this for as long as that word is. And in the end, I'm going to have a password that I also have to make sure that I'm adding Q star S2 at the end, and then I'm going to output my new password. So this is a while loop. It could also be a for loop, by the way. Um, but I'm using while loop here kind of as an example. And then we're just going to go through, and we're going to have all those conditions. So remember last week when you had all those conditions when you were doing, you know, if month is, January, LF month is February, LF month is April. Similar kind of thing here. You're just putting it in a loop. In this case is what you are checking for are the characters that have to be replaced. If it is not a character that has to be replaced, you just add that to password. 
Um, where am I? There am I. So this one, um, yeah, I think this is the one where you're building the right triangle. So this says while counter is less than height. Yeah, this is the triangle. You could also use a for loop. In fact, I would suggest you use a for loop here. Um, so your outer loop is going to be the height, and your inner loop is going to be the width. And what you're going to do here is you are basically starting with um, one. So you're starting the height, and then you're going to start with um, if inner less than or equal to counter. Okay. Output a care. Make sure it's whatever care they've input. And then set inner underscore counter equals inner underscore counter plus one. And you're going to go back up to the top. And then you're going to do that for counter. And then when you're all done, it's going to go back up and it's going to say if counter is less than height. So counter is going to start at 1. And then it's going to go and it's going to be incremented to 2. And then it's going to be incremented to 3 by this counter equal counter plus 1, which is after the execution of the inner loop. So that is what is changing it so that you get that right triangle. And now we have the final one, um, which is, uh, I'll put eating, oh yeah, you're just replacing words. Do we have to, use, hold on. Let me do this and I'll answer your question real quick, Whitney. So basically we're inputting a word and some tokens. And we're just going to say token, while tokens of zero is not equal to quit, so we're going to input some number of words, one of which will be quit. And then we're going to output eating tokens of one, tokens of zero, a day keeps the doctor away. We're going to input a word, and we're going to input a token, and we're going to go back up to the top of the loop and do that all again until somebody inputs token of zero as quit. So do we have to use the password variable or could we use word equal word dot replace? Give it a try. You're in my class. I'm okay with that. I will accept that if that works. Even though the, the spirit is to do a loop, um, if you can do it using Python functionality and it works every time with Zybooks, I'm okay with you doing that. Now, for people that are not in my class, I cannot tell you that that's okay. That is something you have to ask your professor. For my class, I'm okay if students try and stretch themselves beyond the class. And that's what Whitney's asking to do here. She's gone out, she's figured out string replacement in, and wants to see if it's okay if she does it. So I'm telling her to give it a try. The worst that can happen is she can't get it to work and she falls back to the pseudocode and uses that. So does anybody, um, I'm done lecturing, so does anybody have any questions? Um, is there anything else you would like me to go over? This is a lot of information in a short amount of time. Um, and um, Greg, if you want to go over your PyCharm stuff, let me know. And we can also try and look at it and figure out what's going on. So. Open up the mics. Questions? Yes, that's what that means. That's correct, Joey. So, going once, going twice. Okay. Everybody have a great long weekend. I hope you have a lot of fun. And I will see you back here next week. Please, if you're my student, reach out to me if you have any questions at all. And this should be up tomorrow around noon, hopefully. So good night, everybody.